Hello and welcome to another edition of the What is Global Health podcast. Today we'll speak to Rafael de Luque Tuma, a recent graduate from the University of Sao Paulo Medical School, um, who spent a year with the Brazilian Navy volunteering in a hospital boat. This hospital boat traveled along the Amazon River delivering basic need and following um, health and nutritional concerns for local populations that live along the river and don't have access to public hospitals. So as you said, I graduated in 2014 med school. Uh, after we finish, the armed forces, the Brazilian armed forces come to us and they offer us jobs uh, to work a year uh, in the military reserve, which is a temporary post where we become officers and to serve in different places, mostly in our state, with the exception of the Navy, which offered us all a job in Manaus, which is where their main base is stationed in the Amazon. Um, be, myself and 31 other doctors from Sao Paulo, which is very far away from Manaus, even if it is in the same country, chose to go there, especially for the different experience it would give us. Most of us, like myself, are recently graduated uh, we have our, we've been approved in residency programs, and we have the option of holding our spot in the residency program so long as we do this military service. So it's a year where we can break away from the routine of a hospital, uh, routine of the classroom, to try and get some different experience, an uh, experience which not necessarily is a medical experience. So. During the first month and a half, uh, we do a quick adaptation period. They, train, they teach us to march. There's a very brief uh, period on gun control, on shooting. We learn how to wear a uniform, the vernacular, basic things we should know while we're on a ship. And we use the medical experience which we gain during, during our theoretical and practical time in a uh, Brazilian medical school, which usually has already within it two years of an internship, a practical internship. So we're not that green. But for most of us, it was our first job. So we all went there with different expectations. I was one of them which really wanted to travel. These hospital ships go and they, they go through the dozens of very large rivers which are like natural roads which penetrate the Amazon forests within the Brazilian territory to the riverside communities and cities which are far removed from urban centers. The hospital ships go and try to give medical system assistance. The hospital ships go, try to give medical assistance and then move on to the next place. So after my adaptation period I was sent to be the doctor, the main doctor of the Osvaldo Cruz. So it was my job to make sure that everything was in order for the next mission, uh, medication, the equipment, uh, try to talk to my commander. We're, we are not the ones who decide where the ship goes, but we try to give our input. And we head off usually in 20 day missions, sometimes 30. The longest mission takes two months it's done by it's always done by the same ship, Dr. Montenegro, which is the first doctor to have gone and worked in the Amazon. He's actually still alive. And they go from Manaus all the way to Acre. That takes about a month, though they do stop along the river to help some communities. And they stay there so for some time and come back. Uh, but our our missions were were usually twenty day missions. Now my medical school was all in Sao Paulo. It's a big urban center. All my experiences around uh, rare diseases or emergency room for bullet wounds or just the walk-in clinic with usually usual symptoms. We, of course, in Brazil, we do know all the major tropical diseases from dengue uh, to Chagas. So it was a very different experience to me, and it was very different from what we all expected, not, not only as a doctor, but as a Brazilian which had always lived in a city which has 20 million people. So we kind of have this vision that it's totally isolated, uh, totally unpopulated, the whole Amazon, it's about 40% of our territory. 
the Amazon in Brazil is bigger than all of Western Europe put together. It's a massive territory, and we just see it as one big dense forest. But we we we're only starting now to realize it's something which I saw probably in the geography class in fifth grade, but I never expected to really see it. How many people live by the riverside? And I only expected to see Indian tribes. I actually didn't actually see a, a untouched, didn't see a single untouched Indian tribe. All around the riverside, you have these people, mostly came from the poor uh, drought in the northeast, came to the, came to the north, where it always rains, there's no shortage of water, even if it's not that clean, uh, but the earth is rich, everything you plant there works. And there are dozens of actually large, large cities along the riverside, about 50,000 people in each city. And um, these cities do have some form of medical care, like a, a hospital, a hospital with a surgeon, an emergency room, uh, uh, nursery ward, and with the small uh, postos de saúde, which are sort of walk-in clinics. They're sort of the backbone of the primary health care in Brazil. And the ships would sometimes stop there, which was kind of redundant, but we would mostly try to stay away from these and go to the really small villages, which didn't have absolutely anything. Sometimes what they had was an agente de saúde, a health agent, which was actually just a native with no, with very little preparation, which was the only intermediate they have with the um, secretary of health of the state. So it was kind of the person who tried to bring medication, try to warn people of the major diseases, but it was usually someone very poorly instructed. It wasn't even a uh, it didn't even reach an orderly. The mission is basically a mercy mission. It's a palliative attempt to try and bring comfort to the local populace. We come with about four doctors and four dentists, which are sometimes more important than the doctors. We have about uh, six sergeants or corporals which work as orderlies, which are sort of combat medics, the equivalent of a combat medic. Uh, sometimes we get a nurse, and then we open up shop for about a day. Everyone which has some sort of need comes to us. You usually, you kind of fantasize about seeing these rare tropical diseases, these bizarre ailments, like a hardy people being assailed by this bizarre disease, but mostly they're just regular people. When they do have a bad condition, most of the communities do have a hospital which they can reach, even if it is like 12 hours away, away on a boat. Though there are almost no roads, the rivers work as a natural transportation, so they all have a very little sort of a long sort of canoe. And even if they take this little precarious transportation, they usually have an, an hospital six, 12 hours away. So it's very rare you come and you find someone who's had a fever for a month. The, that guy usually gets to, um, to a hospital before we get there. So it's usually a very ignorant, poor community. When they see the doctor, sometimes they just want to see a doctor. They want to say they saw a doctor. They feel like their health has improved just because he sat in front of me and I talked to them, which sometimes does help, but about a large percentage of them were people which came and they, they, they had like a flu and the flu had passed. They had no symptoms, but they had had something, even if uh, very vague, about a week ago. They just want to go by the doctor, see how things were. So we try to do the best we could. We try to try uh, and teach them new diets. They obviously, what they eat there is manioc, which was a sort of root, it's like a, a potato. So it's basically carbohydrates. You kind of make flour out of it. It's a whole process, it takes days just to make flour out of it, and then they eat, it, they eat it with the fish they get, which is a very oily, fatty fish they have in the river. Uh, various fish, tambaqui, prarucu, 
Some, some of the rivers aren't as rich in fish as others, but m most of them do get fish. Whatever the surplus, they do manage to sell. But that's your diet. It's fish, a fat, very oily, fatty fish, and the flour. So it's all carbohydrates. So it's terrible that children are malnourished. The adults are obese. So you kind of see this curve where the kid is way below its, its, it's way below its height for its age in the who chart. And when they reach a certain age, then they just start to get, grow fatter. They, try, they age way faster because they spend their entire day under the sun. They don't eat well. Uh, it's very scary. So until the kid's 12, it looks six years younger than it actually is. After it reaches 12, it starts to age exponentially, exponentially, and you meet like a 30-year-old woman, she looks like she's 50. That's commonplace. So we try to get them to plant something new in the village. We try to teach them that it's important to get some exercise and not just sit around all day, uh, which of course, in a day, you only get a day for each community, so it's very hard to get some information across. But after the day's done, we try to prescribe the medication. So what we mostly get is either symptoms have gone, it's like a flu, there's, so what we mostly get is simple things. So it's the flu, uh, urinary tract infection, headaches, they spend the entire day without eating, without drinking water, uh, working on the fields, and then they get a headache at the end of the day, and they ask the doctor, what's that headache about? And when we tell them the obvious, sometimes they don't believe us. But it's headaches, back pain from working with a hole the entire day, your entire life. Uh, urinary tract infection. Uh, we try to give the pregnant women sort of a follow-up. Uh, but health in most parts along the river, if you leave the riverside and go inland, then it's terrible. Then you're in the middle of the jungle, there's malaria, it's all terrible. But by the riverside where the Navy goes, usually the women can get some form of birth control. Usually it's injected to make sure they follow through. They can get surgery. But what we mostly do is get there, they just feel happy, they feel like they're being supported. When we go there more than once a year, they really feel like they're being cared for. We try to educate them about some absurd things they do. It's common for the rivers. The rivers are, in the most part, very big, especially during the flood season. The, during the flood season, it re, sometimes the entire village is wiped out. They have to move away. And they come back. But the river is so big that they just feel they can get water there without problem. And it is true, they can't get water, they don't die of it. They've been drinking that water for hundreds of years. They're still there, but they defecate meters away sometimes from where they wash their plates, from where they drink their water. And they, don't, they just don't get it that that's wrong. And it's very hard to convince an adult after he's been doing that the entire life that that's wrong. Especially, again, we only have a day. So we really try to focus on the kids, try to give them lessons, uh, use the techniques, make them repeat it back after we've said it. And then the day's done, we go back, back to the ship, then we get a few hours, just relax, maybe watch some TV, um, watch a DVD. Uh, sometimes you pass by a city, there's a cell phone reception, we get to call our families, if the commander allows it. And uh, the next day, it's back to the same thing. What, what some ships do is a bahanka. They just they, they bump into the riverbed, and they just stay there. And uh, the riverbed is usually very flat, so you can just put a ramp down. The patient needs exams. We have an onboard laboratory where we get basic blood work, biochemistry, so we usually send the, the blood sample back to the ship on the motorboat uh, on board. Sometimes we get an x-ray. So um, as you said, these communities aren't completely isolated and aren't completely inaccessible. So the biggest needs that you had was more for educating the population and just being there as a comforting presence to those communities. Did that make the 
work you did any less meaningful for, for you? Because as you said, you expected to see more acute medical urgencies and more sort of an adventurous uh, medical venture into the unknown. And what you saw was just more the inattention of an education system and the general lack of a culture regarding day-to-day -day health and not acute lack of medicine or an absolute inaccessibility to any sort of health care. No, I don't consider that a disappointment because the the rare diseases, those diseases you see in a book, and then you, it's for a doctor, it's always very interesting, very exhilarating. If you get a patient with that rare disease and treat him and see you get better, that's not why I went to the north, to the isolated region. I had that here in Sao Paulo. I, I feel like what I went there for I found, which was just to try to find out how these very poor people lived there and what it was really all about and not just seeing it in a book. What we're used to is urban poverty here in Sao Paulo, which is very different. I, I hadn't realized how different urban poverty and rural, rural poverty could actually be. So in the urban environment, sometimes you usually do have a bigger access to school system and to the to the to the healthcare system, but you're sometimes subjected to some terrible conditions you don't find it in the farm on the countryside. So it's very common here in São Paulo for entire families to live in a single room, and if one of those family members, which is very common, is an aggressive type, a violent type, or tied to crime, then the other ten people live in a constant fear of this of that person, even if it is a family member. That's very common. It's very terrible. You can't. There's very little a doctor can do in that kind of situation. If a person is poor and he doesn't have mon m money for food, we do have social social care in Brazil, but he might starve. Uh, in the countryside, it was terrible. There were it was harder to get to a hospital if you got to one. Uh, some some people some places were really isolated. There was no hospital. Uh, there was no school but though most of them did have a place like that. But if you you could plant your own food anywhere you'd like, you just you just had to draw it, draw a place in the land and say, this land is mine, I'm going to plant my manioc here or my vegetables. If someone in your house didn't appease you, you could just build your house. It took a month. They had raised a wooden house. They were living. They could just go to another community and live there. Uh... In urban, the worst part of, of the urban poverty, obviously, which I could, I could see here in Sao Paulo, was the violence, the drugs. It's very easy, even if the guy has, if a, if a young adult or an adolescent has access to school, he gets mixed up with drugs, uh, with, uh, with drug dealers, with crime. There, the influence isn't as strong, but it's a different type of... They're still, they are more ignorant. Um, other things, I would try to convince them, why, why don't you try and plant more cabbage or more watermelons, not just to sell, but for you to eat so you have a different diet? It wouldn't get through. They just didn't want to make it different. They would beg for vitamins. They saw the vitamins sort of as tonics. So the vitamins were like this magical pill which would make them work harder and feel better. And I usually would try to hold back and say, no, this is not a magic pill. You have to try and find a better diet. You have access to that. You have to work harder for that. The vitamin isn't going to fix it all for you. Um, so as you said, being a recent medical student that grew up and practiced in Sao Paulo, like you said, had a, a series of different other concerns than the populations in the Amazon that you were seeing, urban violence, urban poverty, but still a somewhat limited access to basic resources. And then you were thrust into a community that had basic needs in the sense of education and experiencing a doctor. After all this experience and after all that initial shock and the adaptation that you had to go through, um, what is the most important thing you learned? Of course, as a doctor, you always gain more medical experience, whatever, the, whatever you're doing. So I try my best at that. I met new people, made new friends, saw different places. Uh, contact with nature is always good. I learned how to wear a uniform. But I, I really started to grasp how 
a strong collective system that benefits the people actually works and what it actually requires and how healthcare, what we actually need for healthcare isn't as simple as in Brazil where we have a constitution that tells us that it's the state's obligation to give every person healthcare, even foreigners. So any person in, in Brazil, by law, can go into a hospital, they get, to see, they get the, all the treatment they need, all the medication they need. Even if it's 100,000 chemotherapy, they get it. The Constitution says they have a right to that. Uh, but the law just isn't enough. So the ships in an ideal world would not exist. What they do is a mercy mission. It's for very isolated people. Let's try to do what we can, try to help them. It's a big ship. It's got about 60 people. Uh, it looks like a military ship. It's very imposing. People really enjoy seeing it. They really feel like there's a system there. But in a perfect world, the ships would not exist. The ships are specifically specifically built for isolated regions. And they're very, they could be very good at that. They have a very big potential to help these isolated regions and, uh, and give up the basics of what they need. But for a true healthcare system, what we're desperately trying to find out, desperately trying to put in effect uh, after what we wrote on a piece of paper, requires so much more. So I immediately realized the doctor, I wasn't as important as, for example, an engineer who could come and build a septic tank or an agronomer who could come and teach him to plant something different than just the manioc. So that's just the basics. Uh, many of them don't have school teachers or the school teacher comes six months a year and then it's one teacher for 20 kids of different ages so it messes all of the cur uh, curriculum up. Uh, they don't have middle school. For the middle school they have to go to a bigger city. Some of them obviously can't afford to move to a bigger city or they know they're going to live in terrible poverty there. And those are all things that are way necessary before you have a basic health care coverage. Moreover, I realized there were so many communities. I, I, always, I, was all, I had always seen it at just some isolated tribes in the middle of the jungle. There are 20 million people living in the Amazon. That's a lot of people. And they produce virtually nothing, the people in the, on the riverside. They live off of uh, they live off of social wealth. Well, they live off the, off of the social welfare, the Bolsa Familia, which basically saved their lives. Without it, most of them would live in absolute misery. It's what gets them to live only in poverty. But it's the base minimum for the human condition. And but they produce nothing. All the money they have, all the money they produce. It's from the manioc flour and the, um, some of the fish surplus, which is left. But that's not enough to pay for a hospital, a middle school, city center. That's just impossible. So even if the rest of the country worked really hard to give that to them, it, wouldn't, it still wouldn't work. It's, it's just too much. We can't just... We can't just make it a right and hope that the whole structure will sprout out of the ground. And that got really, really clear to me as someone who, from day one in medical school, was taught that public health care is the way to go, that private health care is a thing of the past, it costs way too much, uh, public health care should be the way, it shouldn't be uh, a profit. Shouldn't be about, it shouldn't be about profit margins. It should be about it should be about healthcare. Our constitution is right on that, but it's just apparent of how much work goes into building that. It's not just a right; it's a whole structure that goes around it, and it's not that easy. So the the chips are good for now, but we have to aim higher, and that takes a whole lot of things, just way too many things, and. I didn't feel overwhelmed, but I knew that the most important thing there that I was doing was me gathering experience. 
and just being a helping hand to the people. It was very common to have a patient just burst out in tears in the middle of the consultation. They would come with these vague complaints, tingling in the fingers, some weird headache, which really didn't point to anything. And then when you ask how things are were at home, there was always the housewife, the stay-at-home mom, and that's all they knew about their life was staying at home and taking care of five children, sometimes more, sometimes up to 12 children. And they thought that was normal, and they didn't, they didn't think, they didn't understand why they were depressed, but they were living this terrible lifestyle. Uh, some men, some young men, which kind of, kind of had these small hopes and dreams, but it was normal to ignore that and just be a farmer for the rest of your life. Or sometimes when you were in such an isolated place, you would come upon someone who said, oh, I love to paint. And you would see their eyes sparkle as they said that amidst all their suffering. Or they taught me how to play the recorder, taught me how to play the recorder. And they, they would just smile. And you would try to get them to take that back. But I, you also fantasize about the, the, oh, it's like a countryside life, so much calmer, they should be much cent more centered people, they're probably living happy lives. Maybe in, the, maybe in the countryside in Sao Paulo, but there, we're just, we're just fooling ourselves. We're just pretending, we're just ignoring a problem if we say, oh, they're all happy there, it's great to live outside the city. So for our last question and bringing the issue back to global health, after all you said that the boats on their own weren't enough to um, give the community what they needed and it was just a small part of a bigger problem, in the issue of global health, do you think that health is then more than just the immediate pointed doctor-patient relationship, like you said, just bringing them medicine or just bringing them consultation? And should the approach that global health takes to bring um, stability and health as a whole to isolated communities like this, should that approach be multi-pronged in the sense that it's not only health, not only hospitals, but like you said, agronomers that will teach the community how to use the land, how to how to make it bountiful and diverse, um, engineers that will give them accessibility, um, schools that will give them education, and in the long term will teach them how to take care of their own bodies, how to have a balanced health, how to have a balanced diet, um, instead of just what we see more nowadays, which is send them medicine, build hospitals. Um, like you said, that's what Brazil has been trying to do, but that has been failing to establish a long-term, stable healthcare network because it lacks the other bases that uh, efficient healthcare system needs, which would be education and general resources and access to knowledge. And even the issue that you brought up about um, mental health and having opportunities and feeling like you're living an accomplished life, things like that aren't something that a Doctors Without Borders doctor can simply bring to a refugee camp in Syria. So what do you have to say about that broader need of global health? So there are very few crisis moments in Brazil. We don't have natural disasters. We have violence, but we don't have wars. So we're, it's never a relief effort. It's, it's a palliative move. That doesn't mean that it's a bad move. It's sometimes necessary to be just palliative. But we have to see beyond that. And there's a whole science that goes into it. Before I got into med school in Brazil, I still saw healthcare as a business, which should be regulated by demand, very few government control, profits should be involved. But slowly you realize that it's all about a science that goes into it. And that science takes into account a number of factors, and the doctor is just one. So you, we'd have to have a nutritionist on board, physiotherapists, someone to teach physical eds, all those different things, and we're just, we're at the most the tip of the spear. I think a more correct thing, we're just another, actually the doctor is just another part of this, of this big chain. It's no use to just wait for the patient to come to you with a complaint when it would have cost 10 times less if you've taught, if you had taught him how to avoid having that thing all together. And that's where the science comes in of it all. And we do live in one of the largest economies of the world. We do have big taxes in Brazil, but the money just doesn't get there. And 
it was very common people would not hesitate to say that congressmen would buy votes, so councilmen, councilmen would buy votes, sometimes even mayors, and we're talking about the biggest municipalities in the world, the size of a municipality in the Amazon. The Amazon state is bigger than most countries in Brazil, and it's divided into dozens of municipalities, and each municipality is gigantic. It's just, it's, most of them are the size of a country altogether. But the money just gets there and just doesn't get to where it needs. So it was common for us to find healthcare places, healthcare points, places where they would concentrate the medicine, some professionals, which were just husks. They were the concrete, the bricks, the roof, nothing else, no windows, no, no flooring, let alone a professional there. The money just doesn't get there. Uh, the teachers, as I said, poorly paid. Sometimes they live inside the school, which is sometimes just a hut. An interesting thing they have there is a sort of motorboat school bus. So it's like a little yellow motorboat, which can fit about 20 kids, which would go from community to community, bringing the kids to school. So that's smart. That's using the natural terrain, which is the river, which is this natural highway they have. All you need is a simple boat and a motor. But many of, the, many of them were just stopped, not in use. There wasn't gasoline for the. How do they buy the motorboat and don't have a gasoline? So there's all these complex issues, and it's it was always very clear to me, even here in Sao Paulo, how much we're just, we're important parts, but we are a piece of this large chain pushing us towards uh, better well-being for the whole country. And there are so many issues that we have to take in, in, in consideration. Healthcare is the most expensive right a person can afford. It's the most expensive right a country can afford. School equipment isn't as expensive as an MRI. A single MRI is a fortune. Cop equipment doesn't reach an MRI. That's just one piece of equipment you need in healthcare. So it's an economical issue. It's an educational issue. It's cultural issue. It's an educational question. It's basically a scientific question at this point. How do you get healthcare to everyone, the basic quality, without busting all without busting an economy. And that's something people have to take into consideration. It's an important right, and I think the whole world is slowly stepping to realizing that it's a basic human right to have health care.